welcome to the colloquium series. Uh, I think this is the first colloquium that we do for the fourth term, uh, for something like this. So let me just remind you what's, what's the goal of the colloquium as, a, as, a, as an event that is institute-wide. So we try to invite uh, distinguished faculty members from places worldwide. Now, the fact that we get them out for MIT it's, it's, not, it's not intended, but many of them come from the top places in the US, from Europe, from Russia, from, from anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a chance for the East Country community to see what other people in the world are doing. And it's a, it's a purpose cross disciplinary. So, just to remind uh, what's the philosophy of this. So, every semester uh, we set on a topic. And this topic is being voted by the community. The community chooses what the topic is going to be. And uh, this, this semester has to do with societal challenges. And we try to, to invite people from the, the, going to discuss this topic kind of on, on different tables, right? from different fields, from different uh, origins. And uh, question and answers are really, really welcome. So uh, at the end of the presentation, you're going to have a chance to, to, to interact with our guest. So, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Konstantinos ah. Daskalakis, also known as Kostis, right? Uh, so, X Window Consortium Associate Professor of Computer Science at MIT, and he also the Government Director of Computer Engineering at the International Technical University of Athens, and a PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences from UC Berkeley. Uh, his research interests lie in theoretical computer science and specific economics and mobility. Skalakis, Professor Skalakis, is in the in 2007 Microsoft Graduate Research Fellowship, 2008. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> in 2008, ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award, the Imperial Computer Science Prize from the Game Theory Society. 2010 Sloan Fellowship in Pure Science, 2011 SAIM with Standing Theory Prize, 2011 Ruth and Joyce Pine Award for Distinguished Teaching, 2012 Microsoft Research Faculty Fellowship, 2015 Research and Development Award by the Value and Research Science Foundation. So, it's receiving the best paper awards at the ACM Conference of Economics and Computation in 2006 and 2013, which all means that he knows what he's talking about. So, welcome, and uh, thank you to have you here. Yeah. Uh, hi everybody, I'm happy to be here, thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm going to talk about the interaction of, uh, so of computer science and economics. And my background is algorithms, so where I'm coming from is theoretical computer science. But I'm explain the trajectory, I'll, I will explain that to the trajectory of my research and how it's motivated. So uh, an algorithm is, uh, thinks of an algorithm as a computational procedure that takes an input and uh, uh, computes a function on that input. And uh, there are many ways to compute a function and uh, good algorithms are efficient ways to compute a function on the input. So this is a standard point of view, however in practice uh, a lot of times uh, the algorithm that's given to the input is actually provided by some agents that hold pieces of that input. And uh, what makes the situation complicated is that these agents actually care about the output of the algorithm. And as a result, they try to manipulate the inputs they provide into the algorithm to affect the output of the algorithm. So as a central designer who wants to uh, computer property, uh, computer function, you have to care about how agents are providing the input to you and may misbehave to influence your computation. Uh, and, um, okay, so that's from a sort of like uh, theoretical point of view. So, in practice, so there are several interesting applications of the intersection of uh, computer science and economics. And uh, all of this, pro I'm going to show a bunch of them on the screen, but if you think about it, all of these problems involve a central designer who wants to compute something, but uh, he doesn't have the information that he wants to 
use to compute that function and, and there is this interaction of incentives and computation involved. So here's some applications in this interface. They're all, most of them are very modern applications. So, uh, you know, uh, online markets and online advertising are basically the lifeblood of the modern, you know, modern, like online economy. Uh, and if you think about it, of course, they involve several parties with different uh, objectives. Uh, public good auctions, like spectrum auctions, also involve uh, a government that wants to allocate uh, licenses in a, an efficient manner, uh, uh, and also uh, TV stations or telecommunication uh, companies who want to optimize their own uh, uh, objective, objectives. So again, from the perspective of the government, uh, you want to you want to compute an efficient allocation. However, you you don't have the information you need to compute that efficient allocation, and you have to incentivize those agents, the, those companies, to provide the information that you need to, to do an efficient allocation, and so on and so forth. So here's some sample of uh, very modern applications uh, uh, that all involve. Uh, several parties and, and, and the interaction of incentives and computation. Okay, so from uh, you know, these two applications that I just mentioned to, to the applications of national security, uh, the sharing economy, uh, companies like Uber and Upwork, cryptocurrencies, kidney exchanges, and game boards. So all, all of these applications involve computations on inputs that you don't actually have. Uh, and and those inputs are provided by agents who are going to potentially manipulate the reports to you and we, and, we, and we change the behavior of the system. So that's sort of like uh, from a traditional point of view, but hopefully this picture now makes more sense that in all of these applications, you're trying to do a computation, okay, so you want to do an efficient allocation of resources or, you know, you want to protect some important uh, things, etc. Uh, and however, you, you interact with agents who have their own objectives. And uh, you have to take into account the incentives when you design your systems. So I hope this picture makes sense. And uh, mechanisms are what sits in the middle to, to make your algorithms robust to the, to, to the incentive structure. Okay, so what a mechanism is an algorithm that is stronger than a, uh, you know, a standard uh, algorithm in the sense that it is robust to potential manipulation by agents. So this is all very high level. So let me just give an example. So I'm, I'm going to consider a trivial computation, which is that of computing the maximum of a bunch of numbers. Okay, so suppose you know you, you, you want to you, you want to consider an algorithm that takes us into a bunch of numbers and outputs the maximum. Okay? So that algorithm is trivial. Okay? So uh, you, know, you go through the numbers, you maintain the max, and that's it. Okay? Uh, the issue is that uh, now imagine, however, a situation where the inputs are strategic. Okay? Imagine that input i has value xi for being selected as the maximum. Suppose that a, there are n agents, each agent holds xi, and the value of that agent who is holding xi is xi if he's selected as the maximum. Now if you do the trivial algorithm, what are these guys going to report to you? If you just ask them, hey, what's your xi? The danger is that, you know, because everybody wants to be selected, they have value for being selected, they're all going to report plus infinity. Okay, so you, if you run the trivial algorithm to select the, the, you know, the highest number, they're all going to report infinity, and as a result, you have no information about the reality. As a result, you're just going to put an arbitrary i, and you know, uh, you know, most probably it's not going to be the right one. Okay. So the trivial algorithm is not robust to uh, incentives of the agents in this scenario, and. Um, <coughs> Uh, there's a better algorithm, and that algorithm was defined by an economist named Vickrey, and it's called the Vickrey auction, or the second price auction. 
and it goes as follows. So what it says, you know, you know, it asks every agent to report their value, okay? And uh, you know, you obviously don't know what the real size are. So, so this guy reports from P1 to the end. Okay? So they just write the number in an envelope, submit it to you. And a priori, you cannot enforce that they're going to say the truth. They may or may not say the truth, okay? So these BIs may be equal to the corresponding size or maybe different than those. But what the algorithm is going to do is it's going to you know, treat these reports as the truth and select the maximum among these reports. Now, what is smart about the algorithm, though, is that if I star is the you know, arg max of the BIs, it's actually going to charge the winner, and the uh, amount that the winner is charged is the second highest report. Okay, so again, the algorithm asks everybody to submit a number, selects the maximum of the reported numbers, and then, and that's very important for the algorithm to work, and I'll explain why. Whoever is the winner, whoever is selected in the step, is also charged an amount equal to the second highest report. Now the claim is that if you are an agent who is going to participate in this algorithm, uh, it's pretty easy to show, I'm not going to show it uh, unless you ask me to, uh, it's pretty easy to show that it is in the best interest of every agent to actually report the truth. Okay? So you, you will you, you know, like no matter what the other, basically what this means is that no matter what the other guys are reporting, it is in your best interest to just report the truth. So when the, you know, when the algorithm asks you to report a number, you're actually going to really submit your real number. Okay? That's, that's an easy claim. It's in your best interest, no matter what the other guys are doing, to just say the truth. And because this is true, then in this step, the real true highest number is selected. And if the algorithm su succeeds, despite the incentives of the agents, succeeds in selecting the true maximum. Okay? So in this strategic world, this algorithm is better than the trivial one. So it's, 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 it's a robust algorithm. It's an algorithm that's robust. Uh, it's kind of like uh, a funny way to present Vickery's algorithm. Let me tell you the real story that underlies this algorithm. So Vickery wanted to, define, to design an auction of a single item. He wanted to design a single item auction that allocates the item to the person who values the item the most. Okay, so for this application, the excise are how much each of you value an item. Okay? Say, say I'm selling this, each of you has some uh, private value for how much you like it. Okay? And what I want to do is I just want to allocate, allocate the item to the person who likes it the most, okay? But, you know, if I just ask you, hey, how do you like this item? Each of you is going to say plus infinity because why not, okay? If I'm not charging you anything, you're all going to say plus infinity. So if I run this algorithm, you're all going to report your true value for the item because the winner is going to be charged the second highest report. And if you think about it, if you, participate, if you were to participate, if I were to run this option right now, it would actually be in your best interest to say the real, your real value for the item when asked. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, so that, that's sort of like uh, you know my sort of like first example of what what it means to make a computation robust to incentives. Okay. So here I designed an algorithm that successfully selects the max, even though the agents uh, have their own incentive. Each, each of them wants to be selected. The way I design my payments, I make sure that people are actually going to say the truth. So this algorithm proposed in the 1960s. But, okay, so I'm Greek, as you probably guessed from my name, and I went back to you know, my Greek history and so on and so forth. So, and I found another algorithm that does a similar computation. And that algorithm is attributed to, I mean, it's not attributed to, it's, uh, this guy is Solon. He was, uh, I don't know, a lawmaker in uh, ancient Athens. So he designed a very interesting law that actually uh, has the same effect, selecting the maximum among numbers. 
Uh, here's, here's, here's the context in which this algorithm was proposed. So, uh, in ancient Athens, uh, you know, they had uh, some large public expenses, including uh, pay for theater plays, gymnastics, shipbuilding, uh, and so on and so forth. Here are some numbers for how much they cost in drug So, uh, the, the way it worked is that uh, about 100 Athenians were eligible, were, were, were rich enough to be eligible to pay for these expenses. And there was a committee that, uh, you know, depending on the expenses that they had, would select, uh, you know, the richest Athenians to pay for these expenses. Okay, so a committee would basically say, okay, we have these expenses we need to pay for, uh, let's select the richest Athenians to pay for those expenses. Okay, of course the committee doesn't have all the information about everybody's property. So the committee, you know, made, made some decision based on whatever information the committee had. And of course the danger is that, you know, they didn't select the richest people, but maybe some of them skipped their attention, okay? And, and, and this law actually uh, is an algorithm that tries to rectify this. And here's how the algorithm worked. So, suppose some Athenian A uh, was selected, but he didn't want to pay for the expense because he thought that some other guy was richer than him and he has not been selected. Okay. Then this Athenian could actually name such, a, not such an Athenian. Okay. So if, if, I'm, if, if you know, I'm tasked to pay for this public expense, but I think that you know, there's this other guy who hasn't been selected, then I can just name him and say, look, I think this guy is richer than me. He should pay for the expense. Okay. Now, this other guy, can either accept to pay the for the expense, in which case okay, the expense is covered, or he could say no. You know, I, I disagree that you know, I think A is actually richer. But in that case, A can actually exercise this law, which is called antidosis, which means property exchange, which says A could actually uh, propose to exchange their properties. Okay, so again, Athenian A names another non-selected Athenian to pay for the expense. If this Athenian accepts to pay, then all goods of the expense is paid for. If A rejects to pay for the expense, if B rejects to pay for the expense, then A can propose, them, propose an exchange of properties before he actually pays for the expense. Right. So if you think about it, um, the result of this algorithm is actually to select the richest Athenians to pay for the expenses that the city has. Okay. So this is another algorithm for computing the maximum of the, like the top maximum, you know, among the set of numbers, <coughs> the, you know, the top k uh, numbers. And, and this doesn't use charges, it doesn't use, I mean, the pay for the expenses, but the, the mechanism is this, you know, the, the, that the core of the argument is this exchange of properties. Okay. Now, let's and Greeks have figured it out, modern Greeks cannot figure it out, so that's a different story. But, uh, okay, so hopefully now this picture makes a little bit more sense after I give these examples. Okay, so now I'm going to get it to Mark. <laughs> so, okay, so this is the, this is sort of like the motivation here that. A lot of the computations that we do out there depend on inputs that some people provide, and these guys care about what we do, what we compute. So we'll try to manipulate by misreporting the information that we control. So, uh, you know, coming from this perspective, uh, some uh, computer scientists, uh, Lisa and Nolan, in the late 90s, basically enunciated the following uh, question. How much more difficult is optimization when optimization happens with strategic input as opposed to what we're usually, what we're used to, which is honestly. So when, when I teach algorithms to undergrads, I talk, you know, always the discussion is, here's some input, do this computation. Okay, here's a graph, compute sort of paths. Here's a network, compute maximum flow. Okay, so this is the typical scenario. So the input, nobody questions the input. Okay, the input is the input, and you just want to develop an algorithm. Okay? 
what this guy has asked is, okay, what if you don't trust your input? What if your input will try to manipulate your computation? How much more difficult is your job? Can you still optimize even when you don't know the input and the input has its own incentives? Uh, everything about this question contains a lot of uh, things in it because, you know, it has at least two axes uh, where it's interesting. One is uh, it's an informational sort of like uh, component, which is it has to do with, okay, so I'm trying to optimize our strategic inputs, like do I have any prior knowledge about those inputs or do I know nothing about them? Uh, so the VP algorithm assumed no knowledge about the inputs, okay? So uh, it, it worked no matter what, uh, it didn't need any prior knowledge about uh, how much the agent value the item. Uh, another question that's also informational is, what information do the inputs have about each other? And in my second example, uh, this actually was important. So the assumption for the uh, anti-dosis law from ancient Athens was that rich Athenians know each other's, uh, how, how, how wealthy, you know, like among the rich Athenians, they know each other's uh, wealth. Right? So if that assumption goes away, then the law doesn't work. Uh, and you know, there are some other more subtle issues uh, that have to do with, you know, uh, you know, like uh, other side information that the two sides may have. For example, you know, when a seller sells an item, maybe they have information about the quality of the item that the agents don't have. Okay, so uh, maybe somehow the, the sellers can manipulate how much of that information they reveal in an effort to uh, improve their revenues exploiting the uncertainty that uh, remains with the buyer side. Uh, so, that, so on the information side, there are several sub-questions already tucked into this question. But there are also uh, there are a lot of computational questions, which have to do with, uh, uh, yeah, so computational complexity, communication complexity, and I'm going to dwell into this a bit more from the rest of the talk. Also, complexity happens at the center, at the, at the mechanism level, so, uh, but also on the, uh, at the, at the, distributed, at the, at the distributed level, because every agent faces a mechanism, they have to think about uh, you know, how they will play in that mechanism, so that there's complexity arising at different uh, places. Uh, and sort of like to study these questions, I'm going to focus on one of the archetypical problems studied in this uh, literature, which is uh, called combinatorial auctions. So in a combinatorial auction, I'm going to now become very precise about what computation means, etc., etc. So there are M items, okay, and I want you to remember M. M is always going to be items in this talk. Uh, and these items are indivisible. You can think of these items as being spectrum licenses that the government wants to sell. And there are n bidders. So again, n is going to be the number of bidders throughout the talk. Every bidder has a valuation function for all possible bundles of items that they may receive. Okay, so the valuation function of a bidder maps the power set of n, namely all possible subsets, to uh, how much I like that bundle of items if you were to give it to me. Now the goal is going to be welfare optimization, like in the victory setting. So in particular, the designer wants to select a, a split of the items into agents, and so prices to charge them, so as to maximize the welfare that arises from the allocation. And the welfare is how much utility the bidders have, and how much revenue the center has. And if you aggregate those things together, the welfare arising from the allocation of these prices is this, because the prices cancel out. If you pay something and receive it, this cancels out, and we're left with this point. Right? So you want to split of the items into people to maximize the happiness of the society for the, from that allocation. Now, of course, if you knew these valuation functions, the problem is purely algorithmic, okay? If you knew the valuation functions, there's nothing uncertain about the setting. 
So it boils down to a computational problem. But what I want to study is not this, I want to study what happens if you actually have no information at all about the valuation functions. Then how could you possibly allocate in a way that optimizes the happiness of the society? Okay, you cannot just go and ask people, hey, what's your valuation function, what's your valuation function, and so on and so forth. They're going to lie about it, right? So again, they're all going to say plus infinity for, for you know, uh, I don't know, for giving me everything and zero if you minus infinity if you don't give me the full bundle, right? So, uh, is this problem, you know, this problem seems super hard. I mean, how can you possibly solve it? Right. So we did actually see a solution in the case where you have one item. Okay, that was Vickery's auction. That's exactly this, what Vickery's auction is solving: the second price auction. If I have one item, then these valuation, these valuation functions just boil down to a number: how much I like this item. And Vickery's second price auction was actually allocating the item to the guy who liked it the most. In particular, Vickery's auction was really solving this problem for the case m equals 1, one item. But how can you solve it in the, this full generality, okay, when these functions are arbitrary and you don't know them? So, that seems pretty interesting, but what is more interesting is actually you can solve this problem no matter what these valuation functions are, okay? And that was done by economists in the 70s. So economists in the 70s, surprisingly, at least before I knew this result, I found this amazing that they can actually solve it. They proposed a mechanism that solves this problem even if you have no clue, you know, if, if the mechanism designer has no clue about the valuation functions. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you the algorithm. It's, 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 it's very similar to Vickery's auction, but a little bit with a twist. Okay, so, again, the algorithm goes around and sa asks everybody, hey, can you just report your valuation function to me? <coughs> well, everybody is asked to submit a valuation function, okay? A function that maps all possible bundles to the reals. Okay, and they submit some functions, okay? I cannot control what they will submit unless I design my algorithm well, okay? So, let's say they submit these functions, this V1 through Vn tilde function. So I'm going to treat again, like I did in the previous I'm going to treat these functions as the truth. And taking them as the truth, then uh, it becomes an algorithmic problem. So I'm going to choose a split of the items to optimize welfare according to these reported valuation functions. That may or may not be correspond to the truth. This is exactly what I did also in the well in the in Vickery's case, right? I asked people to submit their bids. And I selected the maximum. So now I'm selecting the maximum one means in our setting, choose the split of the items to maximize this function, this one first. And what is smart about the algorithm is how to charge the payments to make sure that in step one people actually say the truth. If you do that, then this scheme actually really optimizes welfare. Why? Because if it is if there are payments that are clever enough, okay, that it's in the best interest of every agent to report his true VI, his true valuation function, then this scheme actually does optimize welfare because in step two, if everybody says the truth, if all of these VIs correspond to the truth, then in this step, you're really optimizing the real welfare and not some you know, fake welfare, according to some fake valuation functions. Okay? So what is smart about the algorithm is how to generalize this, you know, in, 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 in Vickery's case, we're just charging the winner the second price option. Here there's no winner, right? So here you just decide to split the items in some way and you stop. The question is how much do you charge people so that if they try to strategize, they will come to the realization that it's in their best interest in step one to actually declare the true valuation function. And that, that I'll show you the payment function. I, I won't ask you to figure out right away why it actually works, but here it is, okay, so uh, agent I is charged this thing, okay, so that, what is that? So basically, let me say it in words and then I'm going to parse the symbol. So 
every agent is basically charged the externality he causes to the other people. That is to say, every agent is charged how much he decreases the welfare in the society by being present. Okay, like in, like in the victory auction, if I was the winner, the fact that I was there and I got the item, okay, decreased the welfare of the other guys. Right? Because if I wasn't there, then the second guy, second highest guy would have received the item. Okay? And what am I charged? I'm, I'm charged exactly this. I'm charged how much the other people's welfare suffered because of me being there, if I'm the winner. If I'm a loser, I get nothing, and I pay nothing because my being there didn't decrease the welfare of the other guys. This is exactly what, this actually principle generalizes in any situation. So this PI, if we parse it, what is it? So I'm computing, this, this function is just the welfare of everyone but I, okay? For whom I'm actually computing the price for everyone. So the price of charging I is you know, this, this is the um, maximizing of all possible partitions, the welfare of the other guys, right? Everybody but me, but I. This is what the welfare would have been if I wasn't considered. I was not part of the consideration of the mechanism. This, this would be the welfare. But now that I'm there, and, and, and this uh, allocation was selected uh, by the algorithm, this is the welfare of the other people. I'm just going to pay the difference. I'm paying the difference of what their welfare is now that I'm here versus what it would have been if I wasn't there. This is how much I'm charged. Every I every pays their, ex again, the externality they cause to the other people. And if you think about it a bit, you, you see that this is really the actualization of Vigri's practice, as I just described a few minutes ago. And if you think a little bit more, it's not too hard, you realize that if the way the mechanism is charging people is this, then it's in the best interest of everybody, for everybody, to just say the truth in step number one. And because this is true, then this second step chooses the real best allocation of items. Okay, when I saw this, I was like really amazed. I'm like, how is it possible that you have no information about these guys and actually you manage to elicit the true information from them without, without having any clue a priori about their evaluation function? So that was pretty surprising to me. Uh, but then, you quickly realize that there are issues with the design, and those issues are, are not with the proof, that the proof is perfectly fine. There are issues that have to do with computation. And let me discuss these issues because we're going to by the discussion uh, going forward. So the first problem is that the first step of the algorithm asks people to just to <coughs> submit the evaluation function to the mechanism. Right. But evaluation function is an experiment. Is, you know, is for every bundle you have to submit the, like you have to say like evaluation. How do you describe evaluation function? For every bundle you have to say how much you like the bundle. But there are many bundles. Okay, if you're selling spectrum licenses, there are many possible bundles of spe spectrum licenses. Right, exponentially many in the number of licenses. So you cannot possibly do this. Okay, even if you wanted to do it, you cannot submit a whole valuation function to the market. Of course, I mean, uh, it's not, you know, so there's a problem with communication in the first step of the mechanism. And also, like, uh, it kind of also doesn't make sense as a, even, even a question, because, like, okay, it's also not even true that I maintain in my mind exponentially many values for how much I like in your bundle. So it's kind of like a ticket in the neck problem. So this shouldn't be an issue, right? So, okay, so the solution to that. Uh, okay, it could be to instead of this mechanism, uh, either either only consider succinct valuation functions, so functions that have some structure that makes the description easy, and hence this is not an issue. Step number one, it's one possible solution to the problem. The other possible solution is 
instead of asking people to submit their whole valuation function in the beginning, you can just interact with them in several rounds, asking them questions about the valuation function in a lazy valuation kind of way. Okay? So, but in any event, so there is an issue with communication. And also, like, even if you, if, you know, even if this was not an issue, then this step is very expensive computationally, potentially, right? So imagine yourself with a bunch of evaluation functions wanting to find the optimal partition of the items into the bidders. That's a combina the, the items are indivisible, so that's a hard com potentially hard combinatorial <laughs> problem. And in fact, you know, like, you can easily come up with situations like uh, inspector licenses where this problem, this step is empty hard to solve. And uh, if you look into the math, if you, use an, if you use an approximation algorithm for this step, then the whole property, the truthfulness properties of the mechanism collapse. Okay? So the, the truthfulness property collapses if you cannot solve this problem exactly. So the, 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 the truthfulness, the, the, the fact that these payments are successful in eliciting the true valuation function, functions, uh, very crucially depends on your ability to optimize welfare exactly for the reported valuations. If you cannot do that, then the mechanism is not truthful. So you cannot just say, okay, I'm just going to plug in an approximation algorithm. It's just not going to work. Everything will collapse if you use approximation algorithms in there. So, okay, so there are two issues, right? So one is communication, how do you do this step? And the other one is computation. What if I cannot solve the problem exactly? Uh, the whole thing may collapse. And it does collapse. So, you know, that, that motivates the question, you know, are there truthful approximately optimal mechanisms? If you cannot solve these problems exactly, can you use an approximation algorithm somewhere in, in the design to get an approximate solution? So what? Uh, so that, that that's a very interesting, you know, theoretical question for algorithmists, right? So you know, we have developed a beautiful theory of uh, uh, approximation and complexity and communication complexity. And the question is, how does it uh, weather, you know, these types of questions where we are also talking about incentives? So. After Nissan and Ron posed the question, a lot of people worked on uh, answering these questions, and uh, there are some answers, so let me describe them to you. And for this description, let me even uh, restrict my attention to valuation functions that are submodular. What are submodular valuation functions? Submodular valuation functions are the combinatorial analog of uh, concave functions. Okay, so. Uh, like in concave functions, you have diminishing returns. Also here, you have diminishing returns. So if you add an item to a smaller bundle, to a smaller set, you have a larger increase than if you add it to a bigger set. Okay, so take two sets, one containing the other. And an item that is not contained in the bigger set, so people are also not in the smaller set. So you want to ask yourself, so the question is, you know, if I were to add this item to this set, how much improvement in value would I have, let's see, versus if I were to add it to this set? And uh, the difference is bigger if you add it to the smaller set. So that's a diminishing return kind of problem. So that's some modular, this is a modular function. Okay, so now suppose you are in a situation where you are in a combinatorial auction environment, and suppose that every a uh, bidder has a submodular valuation function. What uh, can you do? Okay, so, well, let's first understand what you can do if uh, people were honest, if there were no incentives involved. If people were honest, then uh, the best uh, that you can do in polynomial time is uh, 1 minus 1 over if uh, factor of the optimal welfare. Okay, and that you can achieve with polynomial time and uh, with polynomially many queries to the valuation functions. Okay, so again, despite the fact that 
where any combinatorial setting where the explicit description of these functions is enormous, eventually. Uh, this result says that uh, you can get a constant fraction of the optimal welfare in polynomial time and polynomial degrees in both parameters, which is the number of items and the number of items. And this is true if you are in a non nest environment, if incentives are not there. Now, the question is what happens if we start introducing incentives into the picture? And now the result that this approximation guarantee collapses completely and there's no way to rectify it. And this is what these two results basically say. So, a result by doing a contract says that if a truthful mechanism uh, makes value queries to the agents, and then you want to make value queries just to rectify the communication issue that is in the VCG auction. The VCG auction has this problem that it requires a lot of communication in the first step. So what if you want to design a mechanism that does a lazy evaluation? Uh, so basically you lose almost all your welfare. If you, any truthful mechanism that interacts with agents in this way, we lose almost all the welfare. Right? You can, this is one, so n is the number of items, so you lose a, essentially you can only make a polynomially small fraction of the optimal welfare. So without incentives, you can get a cost of factor. With incentives, you're screwed, basically. Right? And this result talks about computation. So it says that even if the evaluation function is succinct, in particular, you can uh, submit it to the VCG option, the fact that the problem is empty hard, you cannot solve the second step optimally, actually hits you a lot in, 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 in welfare. And there's no way to rectify it. So any mechanism will actually lose almost all the computer as well. Okay, so both from a compu both communication and computation hit here. Okay? If either of them is present, you're screwed. Okay? So you, there's no way to VCT doesn't work, and there's no way to rectify. Okay. So right, so again, this is an interesting separation between. A situation with honest inputs where you can get a constant factor, and a situation with uh, strategic inputs where you basically lose everything. Okay. So, in particular, what this uh, slide says is that VCG is amazing, okay, so it does uh, optimal welfare in any setting. However, once you introduce computation or communication constraints, this fails the whole. The only cases where VCG actually works is if both the first step, the communication step, is non expensive and the optimization step is uh, uh, feasible in polynomial time. Okay, so this summarizes a long line of work in the algorithms community, boiling down, boiling down to truthfulness is at odds with communication and approximation. Okay, so that's basically what uh, has been out there. And uh, the question is, uh, how can you overcome these problems? Okay. Um, well, you can try to introduce more interesting types of interactions with the agents. Okay, so so far I was considering value queries. You can ask them their values for different bundles. This is a more potent type of query. You can ask them, hey, if the prices on the items were these, what would be your best bundle? What would be the subset that would mark, maximize your value minus price? This is a more potent query. So maybe interacting with agents this way can give you more power. The other way you can get around the issue is to make patient assumptions about the input. So, so far I have been assuming that the auctioneer, the mechanism designer, has no prior information at all whatsoever about the inputs, about the agents. But maybe you have some information from you know, uh, market analysis or whatever giving you uh, so some distributional information about the inputs that will come to your mechanism. So the standard major assumption is to assume that the VIs are drawn from distributions, which you know. So you don't know the realization, but you know the distributions these valuations are coming from. And you're looking to compete against the best expected welfare as opposed to the best welfare bonus. 
turns out that both of these uh, uh, can, uh, can help you. Uh, so, Dobzinski recently showed that, uh, uh, you know, and, and, you know, like, uh, you remember the Lerman was saying that you cannot get even polynomial welfare, so here you can actually break that barrier. You can get, this is not impressive, it's still logarithmically bad, but it breaks the intractability barrier that I've already mentioned. And it's not clear if it's optimal. Maybe the hope is that this can be improved. And even it breaks it for a class of valuation functions that are larger than submodular for which the lower bounds were presented. And even more surprisingly, if you combine these two, and if you make both assumptions, if you, if you make the Bayesian assumption and also interact with agents with the amount of you can basically recover half of the optimum. Because you can, you can eliminate all these effectability results. And, uh, now if I, so now I valid this, now I valid this as well, now let me remove the first one. So if you have just patient, then again, uh, you can show a very generic reduction that says that if you can solve something with an algorithm, you can also solve it with the mechanism. So you can robustify, if you have Bayesian assumptions, you can robustify any algorithm, that's what it says. And this is true not just for welfare, but for an arbitrary objective uh, function maybe revenue or some other big maximum fairness or any other objective, as I showed with my former students, Yang Chai and Frankfurt. Just to have said too much, so let me summarize what I've said so far. So, uh, so this picture has a bunch of valuation functions. So these are additives. So these are valuation functions where I have a value for every item, and if you give me a bundle, then my value for the bundle is just the sum of the contents. Of the, I mean, I have a buyer in this case. A unique amount buyer is somebody who wants to get only one item. So if you give, he has a value for every item, and if you give him a bundle, then his value for the bundle is just the value of the favorite item that this bundle contains. So both are already described. This is diminishing returns. And subadditive is a class that contains all of these. And this is just what it says, subadditive. OK, so the <laughs> Um, um, yeah, it is. I hope you can understand what it is. It's a scale, uh, a scale slower than the number function. Okay, so as I said, so it's very easy to verify that for this class of relations. Both communication and complexity issues do not arise. If I'm an additive guy, I just have a value. Both, both additive people and unity band people just have a value for every item. So they can just communicate these values to the mechanism, but that's not an issue. And also, you can easily check that uh, maximum welfare optimization in either case is for the normal time solvable. In this case, it's trivial. In this case, it's just a maximum welfare. Ma Low or something like that, maximum margin. So both, so VCG can definitely be run for the number of time, for low communication costs for these cases. I also told you that, if, but if you move to submodular, then the intractability hits you and you cannot do anything. Okay, so for these two classes, VCG can be run. So what economists can do in for number of time are these two classes, but once you move here, if everything breaks. I also showed you that you know that if you consider this class that's slightly bigger than submodular, uh, then if you have demand queries, you can break these interactability results, not impressively, but break them. If you also make uh, Bayesian assumptions, you can just get a constant factor for unique Bayesian assumptions. And this is basically the state of the world in the theoretical point of view on this problem. Okay, so depending on the valuation functions that the bidders have, you may or may not optimize welfare. And uh, you know, if you want to go away from these two very simple classes, then you would have to make Bayesian assumptions, otherwise you cannot do it. That's what really this picture is saying. 
So meanwhile, in a more practical world, people run auctions, okay? And they sell a lot of items to people with complicated valuation functions. And you would think, based on the previous picture, how the heck did they do it, okay? The uh, previous picture meant to say that the problem is really hard once incentives are introduced. How can people sell spectrum and, and you know, get, you know, online advertise, ads and uh, objects online uh, to people with complex valuation functions if this is, this, you know, if the problem is completely intractable. And you think about it, you know, like, this, uh, these environments are very complex, okay, so, okay, like, obviously spectrum license auctions are very complex because you have a lot of constraints of what licenses can go to what telecom companies, there are interference constraints, just from a combinatorial point of view, the problem is a mess. And if you add incentives to that, it becomes even harder. Uh, if you think about online advertising, you know, like all these engines run a lot of auctions at the same time. And advertisers bid on different subsets of the keywords. Again, it's a very complex environment. And similarly on eBay, you may go and buy different items. Uh, maybe you have, you have a combinatorial valuation, but you have to go into different Auctions to buy the different items that you want to put in your bundle. So again, it's not. So it appears uh, a bit of an oxymoron that you know people run auctions out there, and theory says that they cannot, you know, that they don't work. Okay. Uh, and, and, and really, what's the characteristic of these environments is that you have very simple auctions, like single item auctions, that you compose in different ways, in parallel, serially, and, and, and complex ways. Uh, and, and sort of like, let me focus a bit on the simplest of you know, these auctions. So, suppose you have a bunch of items, and instead of designing a complex auction to sell them, you just run a victory auction, like you run many victory auctions in parallel. Because okay, so you have M items, and instead of doing VCT to sell them all together, you just say, okay, each item, you know, each item is going to be sold separately in a victory auction that I'm going to run in parallel. Okay. So now imagine that you're a bidder who has a combinatorial valuation function. Maybe you just want one item. Okay. You only want you want to buy one item, and you're asked to participate in n different auctions. So it's really hard for you to actually decide how to play in this auction because. If you go too strong on many items, you risk getting a lot of them, but you really only want one. To protect yourself against this, maybe you go very, you know, you bid very low on all items, but then you're risking not getting anything. So if you're a combinatorial, if you have a combinatorial valuation and you ask to submit bids on n different auctions that are in parallel, there is a lot of risk uh, in participating, right? Because you just you know, you, you have to decide on each item and, you know, and then participate in auction against other people who also uh, decide to put them. You may get too much, you may get too little. It's, it's unclear how to even bid. And despite that, these auctions you know, actually happen. I mean, uh, uh, sponsor search is really like this, right? You, you bid on different keywords and, you, you know, in parallel, many instances happen. So, and if you don't know how bidders behave, how the heck can you analyze anything? Okay, so, like, if you don't have a, you design an auction and you don't have a model about how bidders behave, then all bets are off, right? So you cannot decide which auction is better. That's why people like designing truthful auctions, because if you design a truthful auction, you know, first you prove that the, truth, the auction is truthful, then, now you that it's truthful, now you can analyze its properties. But if you design a crazy auction, then you have no idea how people are going to bid. Hence, you can make no uh, promises about the welfare guarantees of that auction. Uh, indeed, I mean, if you look at data, bidders behave in a non-equilibrium way. I mean, these are data from uh, ECB and Mike Balfour, uh, uh, which he lifted from Bing auctions. From, from, from keyboard options. And you see that this behavior is not stationary. Okay, so 
these are not consistent with equilibrium behavior. And this, clearly there's a trend here, and this theta is not stationary. So the classic microeconomic approach to the problem would be to you know, analyze these options using equilibria, but there are a lot of analytical difficulties with using equilibria, so they're intractable, but also real data do not look like it consistent with stationary behavior. <coughs> uh, so a natural approach to analyze this complex system is to actually analyze them out of equilibrium. Okay? So to, to assume that the agents are, learn, are performing learning and doing learning and try to analyze these options from a learning uh, perspective. And this motivates actually the second half of the title of my talk, which is Mechanism Design for Learning Agents. Uh, and, and this really, this setting fits very well with uh, online advertising. So, uh, I don't know if you have heard this term, but if you haven't, then it's very useful, so we should know it. Uh, this is a very generic point of view on learning that strategic agents may perform in an uncertain environment. Uh, in my setting, so in my setting, the environment from the perspective of every bidder, the environment is very uncertain, right? So, imagine you fix a mechanism uh, such as a simultaneous second price option. And suppose this is repeated over and over again. So, imagine you are uh, uh, an agent participating in Google sponsored search, and uh, which happens over and over again. Uh, Now, non-regret learning behavior is a number of them, but uh, it's choosing a bit for you every day. So this is a bit vector for you every day. It's for agent I, and then you time step T in every repetition of this option. This is the bits that you're going to submit on all the other stuff. Uh, the algorithm that is choosing these bit vectors for you every day is going to be called non-regret. So this is... Uh, um, a definition that you should know if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's called non-regret if the expected utility that you derive uh, by participating in the mechanism using this algorithm. Okay, so this is your expected reward, your expected average reward. I'm averaging over time. There's an expectation. This is the bid that I'm submitting, and this is the bids that other people submit, and these are out of my control. So your algorithm is called no regret if your expected utility is at least is essentially as good as if you were to fix a bit vector and submit that bit vector every day. Okay, so uh, this is the expected utility for uh, using this algorithm, and this is what you would have gotten if you were to fix a bit vector and submit it every day. Uh, now it is called no regret if uh, uh, it guarantees that the expected reward you're getting is at least as good as you would get if you fixed your bit <coughs> and let the environment change a bit. Uh, so this is a very, there are many algorithms that guarantee no regret behavior. There, there's several, there, there are a lot of algorithms that do this. So, in some sense, no regret learning encapsulates a property that several learning algorithms have. So, you might have heard of the terms multiplicative weights of date, uh, hedging, boosting. Uh, all these are basically no regret algorithms. Or, or for the term leader, all of these are instances of algorithms that satisfy this property. So, there are many of them. And that's why analyzing auctions. Uh, from using you know, this language uh, is an interesting one because there are many ways somebody can implement uh, such an algorithm. So now here's a surprising result. So if you run this weird mechanism, you sell simultaneous, so again, CISPAS means simultaneous second price auction. If you do a simultaneous second price auction uh, and you repeat it every day, and people use non regret learning to update their bits vectors, their bit vectors uh, in the course of the iterations. 
then you actually get a quarter of the optimum, even for the biggest class of valuations that are considered the survival ones. And, and in fact, this holds for several other types of simple options that are composed, either in parallel or, or, or uh, in sequence. So again, here's my picture with all the intractability results. And what I just say is that, well, if you assume that you run a very simple auction over and over again, and if you assume that your agents are following this very uh, well-studied type of learning dynamic to update their bits, which is really what they should do if they have no, if they want to make more, no assumptions about how the other agents are going to behave, then you guarantee constant factor of the of the of the welfare for, for, for all the these classes. And this is a great this is a great very optimistic result that was proven in this literature. Well I was always actually a little suspicious about this result <laughs> uh, because it seems too good to be true. Um, and I'll explain why. So uh, running this algorithm, is a, so running multiplicative weights updates, follow the pretend leader, all these algorithms that are known in literature to be no regret, is not that easy in these settings. And the reason is that the action space is exponentially large. So in, in, in simultaneous victory auctions, you want to submit a bit vector every, like in, in every iteration of the mechanism, you have to submit a bit vector. And, and, and the bit vectors line dimension m, the number of items. So the state space, the number of actions that you can submit, is exponentially large in the number of items. Uh, and it just, trust me, it's not even obvious how to uh, run a no regret learning algorithm if your number of actions is exponentially large. So I was always suspicious about this statement just because it's too good to be true. So what I had asked um, is the following. I had asked people working in this literature. I said, well, you know, no regret is great, but uh, is it actually computationally feasible? Or is it another one of these very nice mechanisms, very general mechanisms that are actually not feasible? And you know, my former student who worked with my former advisor uh, answered this question in Bayesian settings, and they showed that uh, if, you, uh, if you're in a Bayesian setting, namely if you have distributions about people's valuations, uh, then the answer is no, but, uh, it's not possible, so equilibrium at least, equilibrium is not feasible. It didn't show about dynamics. So that, that was left open, and, and uh, again, as I said, the challenge for very direct learning is that the number of actions explodes. So what we showed with uh, my offer is that uh, actually uh, we again destroyed the picture that I was presenting earlier, like the, I just presented. So we showed that actually there is no polynomial time, no regret algorithm for this problem. Okay? So it's just not possible to do no regret learning in, 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 in such an environment. Okay? And it's not a bag with the uh, Norigan algorithms that we know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bug that is inherent in the problem. So you can, there's no way to design a learning dynamic that uh, for updating your bid in a complex environment like this to guarantee this Norigan property. Uh, let me not give the details uh, of uh, the statement, but this is what it says, basically. <laughs> it says that, you know, it looked great for survival evaluation, but in fact, even for this little tiny class in here, where even DCG works, you cannot do no regret learning. Okay, so if you're running a simultaneous second price option with unit demand figures, there's no way for the bidders to guarantee that they have no regret. And it boils down again to what I, I, I said earlier, that if you're a unit demand bidder, you just need one item, okay? And you're asked to submit a bid on several items. What the hell are you going to do? Like, so, 
You can go strong on all of them, but you're risking to get a lot. You can go very quickly, but you're risking not getting anything. And, and what the result is saying is that basically there's no way to guarantee that you have no regret. Okay? So even though, uh, you know, if no regret was feasible, you could do everything, you know, if no regret isn't feasible even for this tiny class where even VCT works. Because that was kind of like, uh, uh, this was sort of like uh, a bit disappointing, okay? So, you know, like if you're going for truthful mechanisms, things break away for submodular, then it looked like uh, this no regret learning and type of analysis would help us uh, overcome this barrier. So going from non for tru from truthful mechanisms to non-truthful mechanisms, which we would analyze out of equilibrium. But we argued that uh, these mechanisms cannot even be like it's intractable for the agents to uh, participate in these mechanisms in any meaningful way. So that was the state of affairs. Um, so I need to wrap up, right, in a few minutes. So what is the, what are the constraints? So uh, I'll just, I can wrap up pretty easily. I can talk a bit about this interactability result. So let me, let me actually skip uh, the interactability result because I'm not sure how familiar you are with non-regret learning. So maybe it won't be super interesting for you. Uh, just to, uh, you know, I just want to provide some positive results, actually. So, so here's the state of affairs so far, okay? So, and then, basically, we, we said, okay, so, uh, you know, what, what we're trying to understand is, okay, if, like, given our interpretability result, is the whole picture completely broken? And what we show is that, actually, it's not broken, so we propose a different type of dynamic uh, that is both tractable, and applies to this bigger class of evaluations and guarantees half of the optimal welfare. And now I'm happy because I think this is a style of analysis of complex auctions out of equilibrium that actually can provide a handle on overcoming the interoperability results. So I'm just going to say what the new solution concept is and compare it to knowledge learning. Uh, and again, I'm reminding you, here's the setting. So I'm fixing a mechanism, and I have end bidders who are participating in this mechanism over and over again, over two periods. And I'm going to denote by BIT bidders, I, bidder I is actually now T. Okay, so particularly in simultaneous sacrifice options, this is a vector of bids that I have to submit every day. And I need a way to choose this vector of bids. Uh, in more complex options, this uh, action could be even a more complex object, but uh, think about simultaneous weekly options for, for the remainder of the talk. So as I said, an algorithm that helps me select my bit vector every day is no regret if, for no matter what the other bidders are doing, even if they you know, adaptively choose their bit vectors with the only intention to help me, okay, so no assumptions about it, what the other guys are doing, right? Even if they adaptively choose their bids to help me as much as they can, an algorithm that chooses my bit vector is no regret if it has this property that I mentioned earlier, that my average payoff is at least as good as what I would get in the best fixed vector. In comparison to this definition, which is the standard definition, and as I said, is intractable even for human demand valuation functions. What we propose is this notion of no envy learning, uh, which starts the same but finishes differently. Okay, so it says that my average utility is not at least as good as what I would have gotten if I uh, from the best fixed vector, but it's at least as good as what utility I would have received if I were to win the best bundle in every round. Okay? So if I were to win the same bundle S star in every round, then my utility, so my valuation function is this, so this would be my value for the bundle, but the price of the bundle changes every day because the price of the bundle depends on what the other guys are doing. So every day I would be paying something else. Okay? And this is the 
price of the bundle, which depends on the other guy's bids every day. This is the average price of the bundle. So, so if I'm a, like, so you see, so if I'm a bidder in, a, in, 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 small, in, in, in keyword auctions, then it's reasonable for me to perceive myself as a price taker. Okay, so uh, the other people in the environment set prices for different bundles I may get, and what I want from my behavior is that if I were a price taker, because if you're a price taker in the market, then what you want to do is you want to buy the best bundle, subject to the prices of that bundle. Okay. So what this definition? This definition is really inspired by this point of view. So it's inspired by what's called for reason equilibrium in economics, which is basically that a price taker, somebody who's too small to affect the market, what they want to do in the market is to win a bundle that optimizes their utility. What's their utility? The value for the bundle minus the price that they're paying. Because if I perceive myself as a small fish in this online uh, uh, advertising environment, I would have liked that the bid that I'm submitting every day guarantees me utility, average utility, that's at least as good as what I would have gotten had I won my best bundle at the average price that this bundle will run for. This is what this expression is saying. And this is maximizing your bundles. My value for the bundle minus the average running price for that bundle. So now what we're learning is this thing. So find a way to choose your bids, your actions for every iteration of the mechanism in such a way that your average utility is always at least as high as the best utility you would have gotten if you were a price taker in a market that sets prices for bundles and you're going after your best bundle. Uh, and you want this to hold even if the environment is adversarial, okay? So you don't want to make any assumptions about the environment. You want to find a way to select your bits in a way that even if adaptively the uh, environment chooses these other chooses these actions, you still guarantee this property. So how do these two objectives compare? Okay, so I said this is intractable, and I claim that this is tractable, so it better be that this objective is easier than that objective. And it did. For simultaneous victory auctions, this is easier to do than this. In simultaneous sequence auctions, it's you know, if you can do this, you can certainly if you if you guarantee this inequality, you certainly also guarantee this inequality. Why? Because how do you show that this is bigger than this? Well, imagine a bit vector that bids infinity for uh, a subset of items S star and zero on the other items. If you bid infinity on S star and zero on everything else, then certainly you're winning S star and you're not winning anything else. So your value certainly every day you're basically getting this value because you're always winning this bundle. And what is the price that you're paying? Well, the price that this bundle is running for every day is exactly this. So if you manage to compete against all possible bid vectors, you are certainly guaranteeing this, but not the other way around necessarily. So in simultaneous weekly auctions, this is harder to implement than this, which explains why this is intractable, and as I claim, this is tractable. Okay. Moreover, if you want to think about it this way, this is the hierarchy of solution concepts in economics. So at the core is the Nash equilibrium. It's a very restrictive type of behavior which contains correlated, which is containing correlated equilibrium, which is containing the outcomes of knowing like learning. So the new solution concept that we're proposing is knowing learning, which includes everything else. Now, from an analysis point of view, this is a good thing to do because it says that uh, you're even more permissive about what the heck the bidders are, are trying to do. Okay? So the, the, the narrower your solution concept is, the more assumptions you're making about what the bidders are trying to achieve. The bigger your set is, the fewer assumptions you 
estimating. So that if you can guarantee something for this set, it's a stronger result because it says, I'm basically assuming as little as I can. Of <coughs> if you can make no assumptions, like even if it is, yeah, if you could prove a result that says, even if details are completely rational, you get half the welfare, that's, that's great, because you probably are not going to get it, okay? If you, may, if you prove that in you know, the national equilibrium, they get uh, welfare, it's less of an impressive result. So the bigger you can make the set and guarantee something good, the better for you. So our solution concept is bigger than everything else people have uh, imagined, so uh, uh, that's good, okay? As long as we can prove something about it. Um, and what we prove for XOS bidders is this that even though the set is bigger, so in principle things can go off, you still maintain half of the optimal welfare. So you don't lose the welfare guarantees that no regret learning was achieving. So you still maintain the welfare, but importantly, you turn it into a tractable solution concept. Okay, so no regret learning was getting half welfare, but it was intractable. Now you maintain your welfare guarantees, but you're also making the solution concept tractable. So this is the game that you're trying to play here. So you try to make your assumptions about what the bidders do as permissive as possible, right? enlarge the set of possible behaviors that the bidders can have, while at the same time maintaining that your system works, i.e. you get good welfare guarantees. And this is what we achieved. We are yes. Maybe my question is naive, but I mean, from what I understand is that uh, in the no regret learning, you have more uh, tight constraints about uh, about how the bidders are going to act. So in your setting, you have less uh, constraints, but still you can you can solve the problem. While in the in the other scenario, you, you cannot. So I mean. It's a bit counterintuitive. I don't really get why this is the case. Uh, uh, you don't understand why I still make yes, it you you buffer or that it becomes tractable? <laughs> so what is okay? So that it becomes more tractable, it shouldn't be surprising because since I'm more permissive, then maybe yeah. But but how can you? I mean, you are losing up the constraints, so you have a, a, a your space of solution. I guess it's. A, a, Right, but you can. St it's, it's really like you know, like uh, yeah, when you solve a fractional problem, you relax in the problem. Yeah, yeah so actually, now I get no, I mean, yes. So it's like a relaxation. It's a relaxation. Yes, right? so yes, yes, yes. It's a bigger set that we allow. Right? But, but still, you get a better solution. I mean, you get the same solution. Right. So we well, relaxing without hurting ourselves. That's the game that we're playing. So and what uh, what do you pay for that? I mean, because typically. Something you gain, something you pay. Right. As far as we know, nothing. Okay. So it could be what it could be the case is that the factor of 0.5 that they have for these guys is actually more than 0.5. Okay. So it's a pessimistic, pessimistic. It could be. It could. The best not the best bound we have for this behavior and that behavior are inseparable. Actually, the best we have for this type of behavior. Yes. Actually, the same bound holds here all the way to out there. Okay. It turns out. Uh, but all of these are intractable, hence you cannot assume that agents are solving intractable problems, while well, this is actually tractable. Okay. So we make it tractable without hurting ourselves. That's the, that's the yeah, this is the best of uh, this, both this, worlds. It's the best of both worlds, yes. Okay. So again, just to summarize everything I said, and I'm going to conclude. Uh, you had a question? Uh, I do, but uh, it's a question about the uh, closer to, to, to the very beginning. In fact, I was. Uh, I have a question there, so if, uh, it's better to finish now and then uh, go to Q&A and probably... Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, so again, just to summarize everything I said, there are two ways to go about studying uh, mechanism design. One is to take the classical approach of shooting for truthful mechanisms, uh, or shooting for mechanisms, not truthful mechanisms, you're going to analyze at equilibrium. And both of these are problematic. Shooting for truthful mechanisms is problematic because, as I said, once the uh, evaluation functions become complex, combinatorially complex, there are no truthful mechanisms that guarantee good welfare. 
Okay? If you want to analyze non truthful mechanisms in equilibrium, equilibria are intractable, so you can also not do that. So what has been proposed in the literature is to study them out of equilibrium and adopt the most well-studied notion of out of equilibrium behavior, which goes by the name no regret learning. What we showed is that this is not a good approach because <coughs> no regret learning is also intractable. So if you assume your agents are doing no regret learning in these settings, then you assume that your agents are solving MP hard problems while they're playing. So that's not a good assumption to make. Uh, so this was our intractability. No, the non tractability result was, you know, introducing a new solution concept that's more permissive, does not lose the welfare, and uh, uh, is, uh, becomes actually tractable. So I'm excited about this solution concept as a way to move forward, uh, you know, away from these tractability barriers that exist everywhere in this picture. And to summarize, uh, I argued that the portal practical applications, such as the one that were in my original picture, they all call for a joint economics and computational approach to solving them. And from an intellectual standpoint, uh, they call for answering this question, how much more difficult is to optimize when your input is strategic? Um, in my work, in, in some work I did with former students, Charlie Lundberg, which I didn't present today, uh, we answered the question by essentially not at all, as long as you have some distributional information about the inputs. If you have some information, if you have prior distributions about the inputs, then you lose nothing going from algorithms to mechanisms. In not based in any settings, there has been intense research effort, and even for this paradigmatic question that I uh, occupied myself with for most of the talk, combinatorial options, uh, we get uh, uh, a lot of tractability. On the other hand, I, I argue that the approximation theory has shed light into the welfare guarantees of out of equilibrium behavior in these options. In particular, they can show constant factor approximations to the optimum welfare, even for somebody with leaders. However, uh, it is intractable, as uh, my author and I show. And we propose this new solution concept called no envy, that we think is a, a good way to overcome these intractability results. In that, it is a larger set than no regular arguments, but does not lose the welfare guarantee. And again, this is a picture that I want you to remember, if you care about this thing, uh, that we propose this solution first, so it's bigger, and then there's well. Uh, and our results don't only hold for simultaneous figure options, they work for other simple options that are composed in parallel or in other ways. Uh, what I find important to do uh, in this line of work is to go beyond these XOS valuations. I'm inviting you, XOS valuations are where functions are proceeding between submodular and subadditive. They were bigger than submodular, but smaller than subadditive. Uh, I didn't say what they were, let me say it in case you didn't see it in the slides. They're maxes of additive functions. It turns out that if you have maxes of additive functions, you already include submodular functions. So it's interesting to generalize these results beyond these valuation functions. To go beyond the objective of welfare optimization, there's very little in the non bayesian literature known about revenue optimization, for example. Uh, in the Bayesian setting, you know, you know, this generic result that I mentioned earlier with Chai and Weinberg answers this question for any objective function, but for non bayesian settings, when you don't have distributional information about the agents, this is wide open. Uh, what I find especially uh, interesting is to apply these results in practical design of mechanisms. I'll, I was already mentioning online auctions all along, but I think there are interesting opportunities for applying this 
mechanism design, this mechanism design perspective in applications such as Uber and urban engines. Uh, urban engines is a startup of Balaji Prabhakar from Stanford that is implemented in, in Singapore and in other places. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mechanism that provides incentives for people who are moving inside a city to use certain routes, different times, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, in both these applications and others, uh, you're dealing with the agents that are distributed in the space and they are dynamically updating their behavior. Okay? Uh, and the question is how do you design mechanisms that are robust in this type of dynamic behavior? Once you, for example, do search pricing, search pricing in Uber in certain areas, you see traffic of, uh, you see agents that shut down their cell phones, move into those uh, areas that they are not home, and so on and so forth. So how do you design mechanisms that are robust, that take into account at least? this type of behavior. And finally, I mean, if you're going to do this, of course you have to interact with data because data is what you're going to fit into your design to uh, uh, converge into a new design. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you.